Welcome to Family Law Talk, presented by Kirk Stangy of Stangy Law Firm, PC. Stangy Law Firm is a family law firm in the St. Louis metro area with offices in Missouri and Illinois. Now, here's your host, Kirk Stangy. Welcome to Family Law Talk. My name is Kirk Stangy, and I'm one of the managing partners of Stangy Law Firm, which is a family law firm with offices in Missouri and Illinois in the St. Louis metro area. Well, welcome today to Family Law Talk with Stangy Law Firm. Today's topic is an interesting one. The title is Why You Can't Use One Divorce Lawyer. Uh, this is based on an article on our blog, familylawheadquarters.com. Uh, it's an article dated August 18th, 2014. So as a follow-up to the episode today, uh, you can go to familylawheadquarters.com and read the article titled, Can We Use One Lawyer for Our Divorce? It would be a great follow-up to the episode today. Uh, and we'll get into this topic here more in just a minute, but I'm going to state right now, as I always do, that the choice of a lawyer is an important decision that should not be based solely upon advertisements and that the information you obtain today in this episode is general in nature and it may not apply to specific factual or legal circumstance. Therefore, if you need legal advice, you should definitely consult an attorney who is licensed and competent to practice law in your specific jurisdiction. All right, so on to the topic again, which is the question of whether a party can use one divorce lawyer uh, between them and their spouse in the midst of the divorce. And this is really um, based on, I think, questions that a lot of potential clients have on this on this topic. I know at our law firm, uh, we get these calls frequently, and I imagine other uh, family law firms get this call as well. And, and the motive for the client's uh, it makes sense, or I should state the parties. I mean, the motive for the parties states a lot of sense, but what certain folks are thinking is, is, you know, look, they both want a divorce. Uh, there's a general agreement on the terms. Uh, parties are interested in keeping attorney fees down. Uh, they want to get the case done relatively quick. Uh, I think there can be concern at times that with attorneys, I mean, I think kind of a worry that maybe once you get two attorneys into a case, fighting might uh take place between the attorneys themselves and then the egos of the attorneys can get involved and and that once this happens and the situation that could start as an amicable amicable divorce could all of a sudden spin out of control and turn into a mean nasty divorce that could cost folks uh, lots and lots of money and so the viewpoint is this is a lot of folks want to do the divorce in kind of a collaborative manner in other words they want it to be amicable uh, they want to have a result that works for both of them, and they just don't want the divorce uh, to get nasty and mean, and they don't want there to be hard feelings. They just both uh, have agreed that uh, the marriage isn't going to work, and they want to move on uh, with their own separate lives, but they want to do it in an amicable manner. And so the question then comes, which is, why can't we just use one divorce lawyer? In other words, why can't uh, you know the husband and the wife, I mean, why can't they just hire one attorney? They both sit down with this one attorney, and this one attorney handles the matter uh for the both of them uh in this way you know you don't have two attorneys fighting with each other this way you know both parties are meeting with that attorney and they both hear what the attorney has to say and there's nothing uh quote secretive going on or nothing uh potentially kind of fishy behind the scenes happening and they think this would be a good thing the problem is this is uh the model rules of professional conduct uh prohibit one lawyer from representing two parties in a, in a divorce action like this, it's just it's just not allowed under the rules. And so, uh, let's talk about that, and then I'll give uh, the listeners out there the rationale behind it. But uh, in Missouri, Rule 4-1.7b uh, states, in essence, that a lawyer cannot represent a client if the representation involves a concurrent conflict of interest. A concurrent conflict of interest exists if, one, the representation of one client will be directly adverse to another client, or two, there's a significant risk that the representation of one or more clients will be materially limited by the lawyer's responsibilities to another client, a former client, or a third person, uh, or by a personal interest of the lawyer. And this is based on like I said, the model rules of professional conduct, which is uh, a code of conduct that attorneys have to abide by. And I can tell the listeners out there, I mean, I'm only licensed in Missouri, uh, Illinois, and Kansas. I'm not licensed in other states, but my understanding is this rule uh, has been adopted uh, either in identical form or similar form in, in just about every state out there. And so, you know, to the listeners out there, again, you want, you know, if you're going through a divorce and you're not in Missouri, Illinois, or Kansas, definitely check with uh, an attorney in your specific jurisdiction 
um, uh, they can inform you about the specifics of of the rule in that particular state or jurisdiction. Um, but but the reality is this: is it's just not allowed. And and here's really the rationale behind it, which is. Uh, again, uh, and you kind of key on subsection one, which is the representation of one client will be directly adverse to another client. So let's say the attorney is in the room with two parties going through a divorce, and let's say one party asks specifically uh, whether or not they should speak, seek spousal support in the case. So let's just say hypothetically, you know, wife asks the attorney, uh, should they seek spousal, should she sp- seek spousal support? Let's say husband isn't. Uh, keen on paying it, doesn't want to pay it, well, the answer that attorney might give, uh, uh, might, you know, in other words, the answer could benefit uh, or, or be viewed positively by one party but not by the other. So let's say wife uh, uh, is interested in maintenance, and let's say wife really needs maintenance. Well, if the attorney responds to that uh, client and says, well, yeah, you should seek maintenance, uh, uh, you'd probably get it if you went to court, uh, and, it, and it looks like, by looking at the circumstances here, you need maintenance. Well, obviously, that advice uh, is going to be adverse to the husband if the husband doesn't want to pay maintenance, right? On the flip end, the attorney's in the same quandary if the attorney says, well, no, ma'am, uh, uh, you shouldn't seek maintenance. Um, you know, your husband doesn't want to pay it. And, and let's say they say, you know, this could complicate the divorce. Uh, and make uh, a case that could be amicable contested, and so you know, don't seek maintenance. Well, husband might like that advice, but the wife isn't going to like that advice at all. And in fact, uh, if the if the wife relies on that and then doesn't seek maintenance and then needs it down the line, uh, that really gets to the heart of the conflict. And you could and you could take this with any other numbers of issues. Let's say one party wants fifty fifty custody. Uh, in a divorce, and let's say the particular judge who this case is in front of rarely does 50-50 custody. Well, what does an attorney do if one of the parties asks uh, whether or not they should seek 50-50 custody or not? Again, it's the exact same deal. You know, advice given to one party uh, could be directly adverse to the other party, and this is why you get to the heart of the fact that there, you know, there's a conflict there, and it's just not appropriate for an attorney to try to walk this line of, of trying of trying to represent both parties in the case. Uh, because, again, any advice they give could be directly adverse to the other party. So, uh, in short, that is the rule. And so the truth is an attorney cannot represent both parties in divorce. They can't do it. Uh, it's not allowed under the rules of professional conduct. And so to the listeners out there, the question naturally uh, for some is kind of a shock. And, I, you know, I've heard this at times in talking to various folks. I think lots of folks just can't believe uh, that, that this is the case. And so when they're told that it is, they want to know what their options are. In, in what ways uh, they might be able to obtain that amicable divorce that they wanted. And so let's go through some acceptable ways um, that that a party might uh, uh, try to obtain that goal of an amicable, friendly, collaborative type divorce. And, and option one is this, is in some cases uh, one party going through a divorce uh, can obtain an attorney and the other party could decide to go pro se so an attorney could represent husband, for example, and wife could be pro se, uh, or vice versa, an attorney could represent wife and husband could be pro se. And by pro se, I mean they don't have an attorney. Uh, they don't have legal representation. Of course, uh, you know, I mean, again, this is acceptable, but of course, uh, any party going through a divorce or family law matter ought to have an attorney. And if they don't have an attorney, uh, then they can't get legal advice uh, from the attorney of their spouse. And so, you know, this is, while ethically acceptable, really not a good idea for the party not having an attorney. Um, any party going through a divorce really uh, should uh, obtain an attorney because the ramifications of these cases can be serious and it can be long-term. And in some instances, they can't be changed once uh, once the result is over with. But But this is an option for some folks. And some folks, in some cases, ultimately decide to do this, which is not get an attorney. Uh, uh, and again, under the rules, this is acceptable, probably just not a good idea for the party who doesn't have an attorney. Um, so that's option one. Uh, uh, mediation, of course, is another popular uh, option out there. And I think mediation in a lot of ways uh, is kind of this hip, uh, trendy thing. I think folks like the idea of mediation. It sounds good, and it is good. Um, you know, our firm, you know, I mean, I'm a mediator, my wife's a mediator. Uh, we think mediation is a good thing and a fantastic thing. 
Uh, the thing to just know about mediation is this, is that a mediator isn't a judge, right? So the mediator can't actually divorce parties. I don't know why from time to time we seem to get calls from folks who are confused about that. They seem to think they can avoid court and just get divorced by a mediator. Well, of course, that isn't true. And so what, what does a mediator do, folks ask? Well, uh, a mediator is able to meet with both parties uh, and try to help facilitate the parties in coming to an agreement on their own. Um, and so you know, a mediator can go back and forth between husband and wife and try to open a dialogue uh, between the parties uh, to allow them uh, to creatively come to a solution that works for them. But the dilemma still is this. Again, a mediator is not a judge, so the mediator can't divorce the parties, which means even if an agreement is reached in mediation, um, then the parties themselves at that point, I mean, the divorce still needs to be filed in court. Uh, any settlement would still need to be approved by a judge. And so what you end up with in some cases is, is basically three attorneys uh, I involved in the case uh, versus two. Uh, in other words, you have a mediator who's an attorney who helps the parties come to an agreement, uh, but from there, the mediator's out, and then husband ends up with their own attorney, and wife still ends up with with their her own attorney, and the attorneys work together uh, to try to put the paperwork together based on the agreement mediation to conclude the divorce. And so, uh, listen, if parties can reach an agreement in mediation, I think that's a fantastic thing, and that's a good thing. And still, in having three attorneys involved, uh, it, it could still result in parties uh, saving a lot of money. Um, Additionally, uh, uh, it also uh, takes away the emotional heartache in terms of going through a divorce, a contested case where you're going through the court system. But again, that's kind of the key difference. You might end up with three attorneys in the case uh, versus two, and I think that's a surprise to a lot of folks out there. Um, there's also collaborative divorce. Uh, my wife is a, is a member of the St. Louis uh, Collaborative Family Law Association, and I'm an associate member. Um, Definitely, you can Google the St. Louis Collaborative Family Law Association to get more information on collaborative law. Uh, collaborative law is a great option uh, for a lot of folks out there as well. Uh, and it's very similar to mediation in a lot of respects, except through the collaborative divorce process, uh, experts are able to be brought in. So in some cases, a financial expert comes in uh, to help guide the parties on maybe the financial aspects of the case. Uh, uh, other experts can be brought in uh, as well. Uh, things like divorce coaches can be brought in to help parties through the emotional aspect of the case. Uh, but again, uh, you know, through the collaborative divorce process, uh, uh, the divorce itself isn't obtained. You're just trying to reach the agreement there. Then the case still has to be filed in court uh, and be approved by a judge if an agreement can be reached through collaborative through the collaborative process. But again, collaborative divorce, another viable option. And then, of course, lastly, uh, kind of the classic way, which is husband gets an attorney, a wife gets an attorney, and if you have two attorneys who are good, who are, who are trying to work with each other uh, to get the, the case resolved in an amicable but fair manner, uh, in lots of cases, uh, this is a great option for parties, and they can get their divorce uh, completed this way as well. It doesn't always have to be the case that if husband gets an attorney and wife gets an attorney that the case has to go bad, that it has to become nasty, uh, prolonged, and expensive. Uh, two attorneys uh, who know what they're doing in terms of FEMA law ought to be able to work together in a lot of cases to try to uh, reach a result uh, that's amicable, and that's, and that's the case when the parties want it. I think that's kind of the important key piece is, uh, you know, the parties have to want to work together uh, to try to settle the case, and in fact, um, at the end of the day, that's really what it comes down to, is the party's willingness uh, to try to work together to reach a settlement with one another. And so the classic uh, scenario where both parties have their own attorney uh, does work, it can work, uh, it just requires the parties uh, uh, working together in good faith and two attorneys uh, who are willing and able uh, to try to facilitate settlement in the case. But uh, those are all, you know, real ways uh, that are ethically acceptable in order to conclude a divorce. But, again, in terms of one attorney representing husband and a wife in a divorce, uh, that isn't allowed under the rules. And just practically speaking, uh, for the reasons I stated, it's not uh, it's not a good idea uh, to have an attorney with divided uh, loyalties. Each party really needs to be able to have an attorney that they can go to, get their questions answered, uh, uh, and they can do that in the context of an attorney-client relationship where the advice is privileged and confidential, 
and, and they can feel good that the attorney that they uh, have hired to help them is solidly in their corner and trying to uh, steer them in the right direction. So, uh, again, interesting topic. Wanted to cover it in a in an episode on Family Law Talk uh, because we get so many parties who call uh, asking a specific question on a regular basis. So, hopefully. Everybody found it insightful. Again, as a follow-up to the episode today, go to familylawheadquarters.com. Check out the article, Can We Use One Lawyer for a Divorce? Uh, definitely be a good follow-up to the episode today. All right, well, thanks for all the listeners for tuning in. Stay tuned for our next episode coming up on Family Law Talk with Stangy Law. Thank you for listening to Family Law Talk with Kirk Stangy. Visit stangylawfirm.com for more about today's topic or to put Stangy Law Firm to work for your family today.